We are here with international pop star Dr. Alban, who has sold over 16 million records worldwide. His hits, which include Hello Africa, No Coke, It's My Life, and Sing Hallelujah, have gone silver seven times, gold 30 times, and platinum 30 times. He was part of the iconic Sharon Studios. And if that's not enough, he's a trained dentist as well. Welcome, Dr. Alban. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. For, what kind of music did you listen to growing up? What were your influences? I listened a lot to the so-called juju, juju music in Nigeria with Fela Kuti. And that has developed to what it is today. And I listened a lot to James Brown. And I did listen a lot to Diana Ross, Donna Soma, Kula and the Gang, and all that. How did you get into DJing? I was in the university and there was no money. So I had to do something. I started cleaning in the club. The, the DJ that never showed up one night. <laughs> so, <laughs> The guy told me, can you go and just play whatever, however. So that's how I started being a DJ. I yeah. love that. It's just yeah, it kind is. of it stumbled is. your way there, but then it worked out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it worked out incredibly, right? Just for our listeners, give them a sense of what the music scene in Stockholm was like at that point when you were DJing. And can you talk a little bit about how you came to Eurodance as a genre? At that particular time, it was a lot of 90s hip hop in Sweden. We are talking about... Public Enemy, we're talking about Ron DMC, LL Cool J, and all that. And then came this Europop swing that everybody was doing in Europe. So as a DJ, I played both the American stuff and the European stuff as well. I met Dennis Pop, and he was also a DJ in one of the clubs I played at. We started talking and we said, well, well let's do something. Because I was like chatting and talking in between records and same some funny stuff and he seemed to like it and then we said let's do something about it what did you learn about what makes an effective song from djing when you're able to keep them on the dancing floor that beat or that voice keeps the people on the dancing floor you you need a floor filler all the time as a dj and if you cannot feel the floor then you're not a good one so we were thinking about that thing that fills the floor that thing that you say or play or that beat or that bass or that drum that fits the floor. That was what was important. Anything else, it wasn't important. What was the environment like in those early days at Sharon Studios? It was like a group of six DJs that, you know, joined together. And then after a while, they broke up and then Dennis Pop started Sharon. So it was like DJs running in and out of that studio. Dennis Pop, of course, he was a DJ as well. There were no real producers or guitar players or bass players or songwriters. Everybody was the DJ, including me. So that, that was the vibe. Uh, almost at the end of it came Max Martin. Max Martin wasn't there at the beginning. And then when Dennis Pop passed, he continued with it. And he moved to America where he's, he's making millions and millions of hits now. <laughs> yeah. Max Martin was not a DJ. He's a musician. So that deviated from the whole thing. So when he came, it was like, okay. Where does he fit in? In the beginning. And then he started working together with Dennis Pop. Then he became something else. Can you talk about what the dynamic was like between Dennis Pop and Max Martin? Dennis Pop was a king. He was the man that started everything. was the man that behind Sharon and all that. Max Martin just came behind and joined. He was not deciding much in the beginning, definitely. What is good subject matter for a song for you? I don't sit down and discuss that this is good or this is bad. I just write things that I don't like and things that I like. If I like it, I said, wow, let's write about this. I like it. Or let's write about this. I don't like it. Just like uh, no coke, anti drug song. I don't like drugs. And uh, I just wrote about it. As you became a performing artist, did you consider entering Melody Festival? So I was all dissing it and didn't like it. I was being pushed to doing it. And mm. uh, from the beginning, I didn't want to do it. I didn't like it. The, the repetition was like so so. Yeah. But it's kind of getting popularity now than before. You did it in uh, 2014. And obviously, that's post. Euphoria. Was sort of that post Loreen moment part of that decision for you? Definitely, it was. It's getting more popularity and there's more hype into it now than before. Can you walk our listeners through how you go about putting together a song from beginning to end? I just get into the studio and I just vibe. Sometimes it's like that, sometimes it's like this, sometimes it's like this, sometimes it's like this. It's, it is different from songs. It's, it's never been like that. This is a formula. This is the way we do it. When we got stuck, we just have to leave the studio. We don't force it. We just have to close the studio and leave and come back the next day. Is there something you would say are the most important elements of a song to you? When you remember it and then you can sing it. 
And then you get off the studio, you still remember it. And then you play it for somebody else and then they keep singing it. When the melodies are catchy, they're good enough that you can remember them. I mean, they are pretty new songs to me, even as a writer. And I am able to sing it and I remember it after a while. And I play it for somebody else and the person still remembers it. And then it shows that it has the potential to be a hit song. Is there one thing in particular that you picked up from your collaboration with Dennis Pop? We worked very close together. We worked very good. The chemistry was fantastic. We worked with a lot of bass and a lot of drums. Everything we did was too heavy. It was like heavy, really good drums, good bass line. We, we knew that's Dr. Alban. One Love was a phenomenal success, even bigger than Hello Africa. What changed in your approach to that second album? If you listen to Hello Africa, Hello Africa, tell me how you're doing. And the, it's my life. The, the chorus of It's My Life was more catchier than Hello Africa, tell me how you're doing. Just as I said before, when you can sing along, then it makes right. the song bigger than the other one. That's one of the most important things. Sing hallelujah. There were songs you can sing along in the second right. album than the first album. What was that level of fame like? We suddenly found ourselves in that position. We knew they were better tracks than the first album. They were more catchier than the first album. But still, we could not tell how big it could be. So what to do? We just continued. At Chiron, you also worked with Christian London. Can you talk about that collaboration and what that was like? They were with me in Dr. Records, my label. Then I sent them to Cheryl. Afterwards, oh, yeah. I didn't realize that. They're my guys originally. I was recording in, in Sharon as well. I was recording in Dr. Records. So Dr. Right. Records was mine. Sharon wasn't mine. Dr. Records, was that around Look Who's Talking? Yeah, that Look Who's Talking album is Dr. Records, yeah. The first two was Sharon thing. And then the Look Who's Talking album, the number three album, I, I decided to record it in Dr. Records. Even though I had some songs, still was recorded in Sharon Studios. But most of the songs in that album was done with me by, with Christian Dundin was produced in Dr. Records by Dennis Pop. He came over. Did it change uh, the working relationship with him working in your studio on your label as opposed to Sharon? At that particular stage, everything got so big. It was Ace of Base, it was Backstreet Boys, it was uh, NSYNC, it was what's her name again in, from America, the girl? Uh, Britney Spears. Yeah. Britney Spears, yeah. <laughs> it was everybody. So that studio was crowded. Yeah. Too many people that came looking for Dennis Pop. We started it, but they joined the chorus. <laughs> <laughs> You're originally from Nigeria and two of your hits directly reference Africa. Can you talk about how your heritage plays into your music? And what do you think it is about Swedish pop music that makes it so successful globally? The drums in my songs, that's what I got from Africa. And Dennis Pop knew that I wanted to have these heavy drums. And then the Swedish thing... What is it? I mean, everybody's asking that. That question could be very difficult to answer exactly why. But I guess that everyone in Sweden speaks English. So that makes it easier to communicate in English language when you're writing songs. Can you talk about Born in Africa and how that came to be? Being like from Africa, it was natural for me to write Born in Africa. Yes. <laughs> True. True. <laughs> it was like born in the USA. You know? <laughs> <laughs> born in Africa, so it's like, <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> natural, very natural. In subsequent years, you moved out of Eurodance. What was the inspiration for the change for you? When you write songs and you, it's monotonous, it's good to deviate a little bit, diversify it, make it sound different. And then, be, you know, people that wouldn't think that you're running out, out of ideas. Sometimes it sounds reggae, sometimes it, it sounds very African, sometimes it sounds very Europop. So I got these three styles and I've been moving from one part of it to the other part. How would you describe Eurodance's legacy and influence on the world? I, I look at it like two DJs, Dennis Pop, Dr. Alban. I wasn't famous, he wasn't famous. Nobody knew us. From that, we made things that the world uh, is talking about. And too many people had to record with Dennis Pop. If Dr. Alban and Dennis Pop was not famous, people wouldn't come to Sharon's studio. So I see it as a legacy. When you look back, how would you characterize your musical journey? If I look back, I think it's been quite good and successful. If I wouldn't say successful, then I must be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I think 16 million is a decent number. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the debut single and debut album was 1990. Yeah. It started four years now. This songs are still being played. It's crazy that I could live comfortably without even doing anything. 
from the royalties and uh, when the songs are being played in radio and TV. So it's, it's fantastic to be able to live on things that you did for 34 years ago. It's fantastic. To wrap up, because this has been uh, such a fantastic interview, um, what inspires you these days? What kind of music are you listening to now? I just don't listen to any specific, any particular thing. I just, oh, that's that's a good song. Oh, that, it doesn't matter what it is. There must be something in it. It, it could be whatever. It could be Arabic song is, wow. It, it, the melody is good. It could be rock and roll. It could be whatever. Once the melody is good, it's good. That's a perfect place to end the interview. So Dr. Alban, thank you so much for talking thank to you us. Thank you so I much. I mean, we are, really we appreciate are, it. it's a real honor to get to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you okay. for inviting me. The mysteries of the Euroverse